There is a countdown. I can't see any countdown. All right. I think we are we are live now. Hello, everyone, and thanks to uh, be here. Uh, whichever time zone is in your country. In mine, to be honest, it's early in the morning. So sorry to uh, be a bit sleepy this morning. Uh, so um, I just would like to um, recall to you a couple of things before we start this exciting session. So uh, please remember that the session is recorded and broadcasted live and the transcription are available on the YouTube channel. And please remember the code of conduct while you're attending all the session at MRI together. And please use the question and answer box to make a question to the speaker. Question um, could be voted. So please try to read them. And if you have the same, uh, same question, just vote the question has been already uh, share it. Or if you really would like to hear the answer of that, just vote for it because I will um, select at first the question that have been most voted. And uh, at the end of the session, please remember to join Gather Town if you can and have a look at the program for the further session. So without further ado, I'm uh, happy to uh, introduce to you the first speaker, uh, Godwin. It's gone. I can see Elizabeth and Sophia. I cannot see Godwin anymore. Why don't you do the introduction and we'll see if he reconnects. Yeah. Or Elizabeth would or Elizabeth can start at this point. Happy to with <laughs> if I'm the only speaker yeah, right now. Just, just, just give me exactly just give a bit of context to the people at the at the session. So we have a bit of confusion on testing these things uh, in the past 10 minutes. So that's the reason why we started a few minutes late. Um now we have just Elizabeth as a speaker connected. So I guess it's better if she started and while she talked, we will sort out. Uh, for the other speaker. So, uh, Elizabeth, um, the floor is yours. Um, Elizabeth Vick is a, a science integrity consultant in USA. And I think this is what she will talk with us today. Uh, sorry. Right. Oh, Godwin is back. Oh, Godwin is I'm back. back. Sorry. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Yeah, it's fine. Um, hello. Hello, we hear you. Hello. Okay, Godwin, if you can hear us, um, we just decide to to let Elizabeth start, so you can you can sort out the Wi-Fi issue or whichever in the meantime. It's fine. Yeah, I don't think he can. No, there seems to be a problem with his connection. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Happy Let's... to happy to step in and okay. uh, so he can sort out his. Yeah. His exactly. All right. Okay. That's... Is that okay, Godwin? Elizabeth, go ahead. Elizabeth, can you hear me? You yeah. Now, now I can. Yes. Yes. It's okay. It's okay. Please go ahead. Okay. okay. All right. <laughs> Is she all right? So let's see. I don't see my screen yet. Um, it appears that somebody is already sharing because I could sh share earlier, but now I cannot share. Yeah, I think I think Godwin is trying to share. Godwin, can you stop to share your screen? We start with Elizabeth. I've stopped sharing. I've stopped sharing. Okay, but we can see something. There is a square with your name on it, so I don't know what I'm is it sure. then. <laughs> okay. okay. Yeah, let me see. Let me see. I hope the attendees are oh, enjoying stop this, sharing. I stop sharing. this little show. Like we we need we need to get used to the platform. So. All right. I now there are. Cannot, I still cannot oh, share. Right. I don't know what's happening. 
I see okay, now let's see. two Godwins. <laughs> um, yeah, me too. <laughs> and I can still not share my screen. You still cannot share. Oh, are you seeing this? Oh, wow. This is not good. Well, in the meantime, if the attendees would like to like post in the chat, hello, or like <laughs> let you know that you are here on which part Where of are you the world from? are you connected? <laughs> yes, uh, I can start. I'm Laura. I'm from hello. University of Nottingham in UK, and it's really early in the morning here. So, I'm... what about you? Wow. Um, uh oh, I think uh, there's some confusion here. I think I should just I should just log out and log back in. Yeah, probably yeah. because then the screen. Okay, screen let me goes. try something. Let me see screen share screen. Right, leave stage setting. How do I get out of this? Um, am I just, sharing? Just close the close the tab of the browser. I should close the tab of the browser. Yeah, and then you reopen another one. If I close the tab, I think I'll lose I'll lose you. No, just copy I'm the link. Crown. Copy the URL and then close the tab and then paste the URL in a new tab. That's what I did and that worked. Okay. All right. All right. Okay. Let me do that. Ah, so now I can actually share my screen. Great. Should I start now? Yes. <laughs> All right. Sorry for the confusion. No, that's fine. It's, okay. you know, it's, it's a platform. It's new for everyone. All right. So. We're all learning. <laughs> <Still> exactly. <learning. laughs> All exactly. right, so I hope you can see my screen. You should see now. Yes, I can see Great. your screen. Great. Um, so yeah. for for like uh, I don't I don't have the slide in full screen. So to everyone, you should have a button to put the slide on full screen. So Elizabeth, the floor is yours. I mute myself now. Thank you so much. So I'm Elizabeth Bick. I'm um, I've never done an MRI, so <laughs> I'll, I'll disclose that up front. I am a microbiologist by training. And a couple of years ago, I sort of switched fields and now I'm a science integrity person. I, I look at, at images in scientific uh, papers and I'll uh, specifically look for duplications and, and image manipulations. And before I start, I have some disclosures. I do receive um, speaker fees and consulting fees. Um, through um, uh, work that I do either for publishers or journals or universities. I receive donations through patreon.com where people donate one euro or five dollars or so per month to support my work because I'm not funded by any uh, grant. I'm, I do not work uh, permanently. I, I'm not salaried by a university or anything. I also have worked for a company called Ubiome, and uh, they were raided by the FBI, but I still have four patents from that time. Um, and uh, yeah, the founders were charged with insurance fraud, but none of the employees. But I'll, I'll have a scar on my resume from that time. And if you are on Twitter, you can follow me on um, Microbiome Digest, which is uh, my handle on Twitter. And so um, let me see if I can move it. Yes. So. What I do is look at images in scientific papers. And, and here are some examples of images that have problems in scientific papers. So you can see on the left what I would call a simple duplication. So you see a bunch of images there where two panels shown here in red and two other panels shown here by, uh, so I put blue uh, boxes around them. Those panels look identical. Now, all these panels look pretty similar, and you can sort of imagine that if a person takes lots of photos from something, uh, that they could maybe mislabel their images and by accident grab the same image, the same photo twice. So these simple duplications are often honest errors. 
Here in the middle, I have an example of a repositioned duplication. So you see four different panels and uh, looking at the labels, they're supposed to all show a different experiment. But there, you can also see that these two panels overlap shown here with green boxes. And these two panels also overlap in the area that I've marked here with these darker blue boxes. And so these three panels all overlap with each other. Basically what happened is a person took a photo under the microscope, then moved it under the microscope a little bit and took another photo. Now, could that be an honest error? It could, but with so many photos overlapping, maybe that was done deliberately with the intention to mislead. And it's hard to really know that. But if you look here at the duplication um, of a type three or category three, um, which, uh, so I, I've, I, I, I named those duplications with alterations, you will see here that parts of these photos appear to have been duplicated. These are Western blots and lane A, uh, sorry, in panel A, lane one and lane three, which I've marked with these dark blue boxes, those appear to look identical. While in panel D, three lanes appear to look identical. Now, that seems to be done deliberately. I mean, this, a, this basically is Photoshopping. It appears that certain parts of these panels, and they could be lanes or bands, protein bands, like in this example, but it could also be, uh, for example, cells or maybe parts of an MRI photo. So those Altered, altered photos where you see duplicated elements within the same photo are the most likely to have been done deliberately. While the repositions, you, you don't really know that. Maybe if there's a mirroring or rotation, it's a little bit more likely, but it's sort of a, the, the three categories are uh, helpful because you can sort of see um, or, or, or say something about an possible intention to mislead. And if you want to read more about these uh, three, uh, these types and what is and what is not allowed in images in scientific papers. Here are a couple of uh, resources that you can uh, take a screenshot of maybe and, and use. Uh, there's a video and there's two papers and it tells about what, you know, digital alterations of photos is, is very tempting. And so what are you allowed to do and what is not? And again, I want to stress that sometimes these duplications are honest errors. Now, I, I did a scan of a, a lot of papers. I actually scanned 20,000 papers from the biomedical literature in search for these inappropriate image duplications. Sometimes duplications are appropriate, but I specifically looked for inappropriate ones. And in that set of 20,000 papers, I scanned them by eye. I found 782, so almost 800 papers that contained within the paper a duplicated figure. It could either be between two papers or between two panels in the same, uh, sorry, uh, between two figures in the same paper or between two panels uh, within, um, uh, within the same figure. But all the duplications were within those papers. I made sure to include several uh, different journals uh, and publishers. And so we found that 4% of these papers contained duplications. Now, not all of these are misconduct. Like I said, some of these could be honest errors and you don't always know that. And we made an estimated guess that about half of these had been done intentionally. So that might mean that 2% of all papers contains misconduct. Well, it might actually be more because I'm looking at images, the ones that I can see, and, uh, and that sort of tells you that uh, there might be many more types of data that could have been altered could have been fabricated or falsified and that is much harder to see i can look at these images and see the problems but there might be many other problems i cannot see so the real percentage of misconduct might be much higher might be in the five percent range or even higher and that's a scary thought now uh, this set of 800 papers also allowed us to know what happens with when you report these to a journal so I reported all these 800 papers to journals. And then after five years, because I did this around 2015, uh, around 2020, I made up the balance. How many of these 800 papers had been corrected or retracted? Well, unfortunately, two thirds of these papers shown here in this dark blue 
had not been taken any action upon. Uh, about one third of these papers had been either corrected, shown here in yellow, or retracted, shown here in uh, red. And there's a tiny sliver, barely visible, of papers that have received an expression of concern. And now a little bit later, so 2022, seven years after I reported these papers, still 53% of these papers had not been taken any action on. So this number of no action is going down, but it's still very slowly. And that is frustrating. Um, so I actually report most of these papers uh, online. And if you look at these, um, uh, here is an example of a simple duplication. So I tried to find from my set of examples, a couple that were appropriate or, or uh, were applicable to the MRI field. I couldn't find too many of them, but this was from a paper where some cells were made fluorescent for medical applications and potentially for MRI. And this is just a simple duplication example. And I hope you can see in these five panels that there are two panels that look identical. And maybe you have already spotted them. And I've shown them here by uh, uh, adding these red boxes around them. Panel F and G, which are supposed to be something different, they look identical. And again, this could be an honest error. Now here's a duplication with a repositioning. So type two duplication. You see four panels here. There were four differently treated uh, mice or rats. And, and this is uh, to test nanoparticles um, that had curcumin incorporated in them to test as an MRI contrasting agent. Um, and again, I didn't find any MRI images themselves. I don't focus on those types of papers, but it is MRI related. So I hope you enjoy this uh, example. And maybe you've already spotted that these panels, that there's an overlap in them. And I'll show that here. Actually, all four panels show the same group of cells. They all overlap with each other. So instead of showing images from four differently treated animals, all of these images were taken from the same specimen. And I reported this online, but it hasn't been addressed yet. And here's an example of a type three duplication uh, has, has not really anything to do with MRI, but um, I wanted to show you these are, are fungal spores and there's lots of duplications going on in this image uh, in, these two, if, uh, in these two panels. And this paper, after reporting that it got only corrected, I feel this should have been a retraction. And then nanoparticles are a very popular topic to do some Photoshopping in this paper finally got retracted. There's lots of particles that appear to have been photoshopped in this photo. Now I report most of these concerns. Um, I used to report them to the editor in chief. Now, because I'm frustrated with the lack of response, my main goal is to warn other, other readers. So what I do is I report these on papier.com. And if you do a literature search and you have the papier.com plugin installed, you might see these green banners showing that certain papers have received a comment. Uh, the comments are heavily moderated. Uh, they work by the DOI of the paper, the unique identifier. And I feel they're the best way to warn other re readers that there might be a potential problem with a paper. And the Papier also integrates with Zotero or whatever browser you use. Um, I do most of these searches still by eye, although I'm starting to use software. And um, of course, journals are very interested in using software to look at these uh, problems. And uh, one of the things that they might be using is Proofic, which is a software that a tool that I've never used myself. But it is a uh, it is now on the market and it's being used by several journals to screen their manuscripts with, because of course you want to make sure that these things are not published in the first place. I'm using Image Twin. I don't have access, unfortunately, to Proofic. I have no idea how good it is. But Image Twin is very helpful. Um, I think both uh, all of these, these softwares give a lot of false positives. You still need a human to look at them and decide if it's really a problem or not. For example, with confocal images, you, you do have a lot of false positives, which are completely expected. Uh, but you still need a human to, to look at them and make sure they're, that you're not calling out any false positives. But of course, an artificial intelligence, which are, is the basis of this software, can also be used for very bad thing, uh, things, and including in, in MRI. I'm sure there's 
there's people who make fake MRI images using AI. Uh, I mean, AI can be used to generate faces of people who do not exist. These faces do look very realistic. They're based on libraries of faces. Um, and of course there's Dell E and all kinds of other new AI type of tools where you can just type in some text and it can generate something. And these images are looking already very real and realistic. And I, I, I'm very worried about AI, um, about the misuse of AI to generate scientific images or text. So uh, my last slide, how can we prevent misconduct? Well, I hope that open science and good research practices are going to help prevent it. It's not going to completely prevent misconduct. We also tend to focus way too much on measuring our productivity as scientists by looking at publications. And publications are often uh, only on positive things. I, I feel we need to focus also on publishing negative results um, and, and focus more on reproducibility. Can we reproduce an experiment? Because in the end with AI, maybe the only way we can know if an experiment was real is by being able to reproduce it in another lab. And maybe that's the new way that we scientists should be dealing with uh, science papers. There's lots of conflicts of interest. Unfortunately, publishers and institutions both seem very unwilling to investigate these cases. And uh, there is some slow change going on, but we need, we need much more action from both of these types of organizations. And it also needs to be done much faster. If we find big problems in a paper, it shouldn't take eight years to retract a paper. That seems a ridiculously long time. Uh, of course, we uh, also hope to protect the fact checker or whistleblowers or however you want to call people like me. We're uh, under threats of legal suits. Uh, I have not been legally uh, prosecuted yet, but um, maybe it will happen. I have received several threats of lawsuits um, and this work could financially ruin me, but I feel it's, um, it's a risk I'm willing to take. Artificial intelligence is uh, is on, on the horizon or maybe already here and can do a lot of harm, can also do a lot of good. How can we find a balance between that? And then finally, there's a tremendous cost of science misconduct, not only for scientists who, you know, have might have trouble reproducing work if it was based on misconduct, but also for science in general, because we've seen so much misinformation in the past two and a half years, almost three years that the pandemic is going on. Uh, it seems that um, you could easily walk away from my talk saying, oh, well, all science is flawed. Uh, let's not believe in science anymore. And I do not want to, that to, to be the case. I hope you agree with me that we need science to, to solve the big problems we're facing uh, on this planet, like uh, climate change and pollution and pandemics. We need science for that, but we need science to be good. Thank you. That, <clears throat> that was a really good talk. Uh, my camera doesn't want to turn. Oh, it's back. Okay. Yeah, oh, thank right. you, Elizabeth. I really, I really, really enjoyed this talk, to be honest. Um, as I said, you on backstage, I just read the book about this thing. So it's, it's a bit, <laughs> there is a bit of hype in me in this moment. Um, if, um, is there any question from the audience? I cannot see, cannot see any in the chat. Um, well, I think I will. I will just would like to echo in your uh, latest observation. Like you, you can just go away from the talk and say, "Oh, all the science is a fraud. What are we doing?" Blah blah. blah. But it's not. Like, of course, you show few example of fraud over thousand and thousand of paper that are published. So um we we must remember that those are just few and we should also avoid that those things happen so even if they are just few of them they can have a huge impact on on all the other people's science because of course then you you got to cite those work or visit your subsequent work on this result that are actually fake and that effect it just multiplicates Mm -hmm. Other than ruin uh, the um, uh, the idea of science on the general public, that I think is the thing you were referring to when you mentioned the pandemic. 
Yes. So, uh, and that's that's a massive damage for science, all it the is, science yeah. in general. Right. It is. I mean, there's. We, we. I've also was slightly involved in this um, little scandal that came out about um, Alzheimer's research, where um, one of the main theories in Alzheimer's is that the uh, amyloid plaque hypothesis, and I'm that's totally outside of my field, so I cannot really say much about it, but one of the papers that was important to sort of steer that that line of research in that direction um, now has been reported to contain image, uh, duplicated images and potentially manipulated images. And I was part of um, an investigation by Science, the, the, the journal, because the paper had been published in Nature and Science in Nature, obviously, you know, they, they love it to, to talk about each other's work, if especially if one of the them might be involved in uh, in a problem. And so Science did a research, uh, an investigation to that paper, which was started by um, uh, somebody who had, had found problems in those images. So I could um, uh, confirm that there were indeed big problems. And so there's, there's probably some seminal papers nowadays that we might find duplicated images in, especially with new techniques. And it's it's just hard uh, to know because people had trouble replicating that results, that that paper, and uh, now there's image manipulation, and so that brings into question the validity of that whole line of research. Yeah, yeah, I agree. So we we have a question in the meantime, and um, I think we can address this question and then uh, go uh, to the next speaker. So. Um, uh, uh, so uh, the question said, how how do you suggest that the whistleblowers be protected in the competitive academic environment? That's a yeah, new word it's... for me. Whist whistleblower, yeah. <laughs> whistleblower, yeah. <laughs> whistleblower, okay. <laughs> yeah. Whistleblower, that's the person ringing the bell, raising the alarm. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you could also call us fact checkers. I don't know. There's There's several people who do what I do. I um, post everything on Papier under my full name, but I would not recommend most people to do that, especially if your early career, if you're you know, not yet at the highest level of a professor or maybe even the president of a university, um, it's, it's really tough because you, if you blow the whistle, if you raise the alarm, you might be seen as a troublemaker. There are all kinds of laws to protect whistleblowers, but unfortunately, people will still try then to move you out because you make too much trouble, you rock the boat too much. And, uh, and so if you're a junior, I would recommend to post your concerns on Papier. You can do that completely anonymously. Create a Papier account. You will be assigned the name of a, an organism from the tree of life. You cannot choose which fungus or microorganism <laughs> you will become, but um, then you can post completely uh, anonymously. But if you only have inside information, so you know that the person next to you in the lab cheated because you watched them do something, that is very hard to post publicly because it needs to be verifiable. So you can post on your comments on um, published papers, but if you have insider knowledge, the only recommendation I can give you is to talk to your research integrity officer at your university, but keep it very objective and short and don't accuse anybody. Just stick to the facts that you've seen. All right. That's, that's a really, that's a really good suggestion. And of course, I think my open, everyone hope is that we just don't want need to do that. That's it. Like, <laughs> like yes. that this, this, practice in science won't won't happen again that's our hope so let's work in toward these things so um i will hand um your uh, talk with a comment that has been put in the chat so um uh, francesco said i wanted to thank dr big for her fantastic work the publish of parish culture is toxic and his harming science i think this is a great conclusion for your talk so uh, thank, thank you so you, much. Thank you, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, please stay stay on stage. There might yeah. be more questions for you in the chat later. Yeah, you know, I'll, I'll keep an eye on them and answer them. Yeah. Um, all right. So 
In the meantime, we have another speaker that has joined us on the stage. So welcome to Penny and she will present later. But now it's time to Godwin to present. He is he's already sharing his screen. OK, so I let you introduce yourself because I see that you are fully able to start. You have to unmute yourself as well. Oh, no. So the, where, where okay. are you happy? You yes. Let's. You can hear me now. I will share my screen. Yes. Yes. It takes a while. Okay. All right. Perfect. Okay. I mute myself and remove the camera. So. The floor is okay. yours. Floor is mine. Thank you so much. Wow. Uh, this platform is very tricky, but at least we get used to it somehow. Um, I want to thank you for uh, the opportunity to give this talk. I'll be talking um, just very briefly on uh, strengthening MRI access, research, and training in Africa. My name is Godwin Ogbole. Um, I'm a medical doctor, I'm a radiologist, I'm a professor of radiology at the University of Ibadan, Nigeria. I'm a consultant neuroradiologist at the University College Hospital. I do brain imaging, um, mostly with low field MRI and I work in Africa. Um, I'm also, also a senior fellow at the Africa Oxford Initiative. I spent some time in Oxford uh, doing some work with uh, my mentor there, uh, Peter Jezzard. Okay. Oops. All right. So in terms of um, disclosure, I have no financial disclosures uh, or anything to disclose. Um, I work for the university. I'm a, I'm a teacher and a lecturer. So generally, the layout of my talk will be basically to look at the diversity of the African continent, talk very, maybe a little bit extensively about the challenges of MRI in Africa. I will talk about MRI, the personnel, the practice, and the prospects. I will talk about some tools for solutions that could help us, you know, maybe solve some of the problems in um, Africa, and then possibly give some general acknowledgement. Okay. Now, Africa. Africa is referred to as a dark continent. Um, and why is this? Uh, most people, some people have said is Africa is because it has a controversial origin. Others have said because explorers, early explorers, had no map, or, and then, or maybe because of the resistance to uh, Christianity, but generally, um, some people also say that you know Af Europeans lack knowledge. But this view, this image you are seeing, is you know like the global view of the world at night, and you can see that you know Africa, you know even at night, has very very minimal electricity, uh, and in the areas where I mean the most advanced countries in Africa are usually uh, South Africa and maybe some parts of the in North Africa, and that's where you see it's littered. So generally. Um, Africa at night is, you know, is there's a challenge. That's one of the major challenges Africa is like, and the terrain is actually very difficult. Um, so this is one of the things about Africa. So, and also the other thing you want to know about Africa is that it's the second largest continent. It is the second most populous continent, having about over 1.5 billion people with 54 countries. Uh, it is the world's poorest continent, and but and also the most underdeveloped continent. Interestingly, like I've said before, that is a very kind of an oxymoron kind of a thing. It's poor, yet it is rich. It has abundant natural and mineral resources. 12% uh, of the world's oil is in Africa, 90% of the world's platinum, 90% of the world's cobalt, 50% of the world's gold, the third of the world's manganese, 35% of the world's uranium. And Africa has about 60% of unused arable land. It also houses the world's oldest university, which is the University of um, Al Karakouin in Fez in Morocco. Uh, it's a very diverse continent, genetically diverse, and it is intellectually rich uh, because it actually there's a lot of brain drain. Most people that live um, the intellectual resource it also provides uh, for the global community. It is one of the fastest growing population in the world, and uh, it houses about 25% of the global disease burden. 
And um, interestingly, it has the least access to diagnostic imaging, which MRI is one of it. Um, the other thing you want to know is that imaging is um, something that is very key uh, to, to management of health resources. And MRI is one of the top line uh, imaging tools that is, uh, that is used. This, uh, the current landscape shows that, you know, uh, most uh, develop or on developing countries do not have access. About 70% of the global population have limited access. And about 50% of these actually in Africa. 80% of Africa has no access to MRI at all. Uh, in my country, which is in Nigeria, about 70% of the imaging that is even available in the country is only within the uh, urban centers, like in Lagos and Abuja. And this is the kind of trend you find around most uh, African countries. You know, only about 1% of the population have access to diagnostic imaging and have access to quality imaging to be able to make uh, or deal with uh, healthcare. And we know that MRI has actually transformed modern healthcare, in, and that is the truth. Most uh, developed countries have, you know, I don't know, in terms of strength, it is, these days we use 1.5 Tesla, 3 Tesla, 7 Tesla, even 9.4. Even for research, they're using 11 Tesla now. So the, the, there's a trajectory, it's an increasing trajectory uh, in terms of research, in terms of healthcare, we're getting the best quality diagnostic tools to be able to treat diseases and investigate. But Africa and most uh, uh, developing countries have no access to this uh, technology. But, well, the, these challenges exist and there are tools that are now available to be able to surmount some of these uh, challenges. The two key factors for MRI in Africa are infrastructural and institutional, and we'll talk about this uh, briefly. For infrastructural problems, basically, is that uh, MRI is an expensive machine. Uh, and um, most African countries are poor. They cannot afford it. Most, and then it costs so much. Most African countries uh, usually uh, pay out of pocket. Most people pay out of pocket for this. And then the machines that are available, even in Africa, are obsolete. You know, they are old and they maybe some of them have this life uh, span of about 20 years that are still being existing and being used. Uh, the other challenge, like I've mentioned before, is that electricity. Uh, there's a lot of fluctuations, like my country in, in Nigeria, there's a lot of fluctuations of electricity, uh, poor internet connections for communications. Uh, most times there's no unified or central data storage for communication of storing the patient's information and you being able to do very uh, imaging research. Um, these are the challenges that you find in Africa. One of the other challenges is, of course, maintenance. Most times that you don't have the technical expertise to maintain some of these high-end equipment. So you have long down times. People have to wait, you know, six months, one year to get their machines fixed and things like that. And then also you have sometimes very expensive contracts. So when people buy machines, they do not usually sign service contracts. It's just hopefully that the machine works uh, because the service contracts by vendors are usually also very expensive. And like I've mentioned before, you talked about uh, electricity is a major problem. And I think that is the major problem. I think if Africa can solve its electricity problem, it will solve most of it. In this image you see here, I call it that says energy poverty because it shows the global distribution of electricity. And you see that Africa also still remains dark in this. And I just looked at a paper by Mena et al. that talks about, looks at 20 year, um, you know, neuroscience output from Africa. I will notice that the countries that have good, you know, energy um, access, you know, the countries like uh, Morocco, Tunisia, Egypt, they have the best, you know, neuroscience output. And South Africa, if you can see, those are the areas that are lighted, you know, in the yellow. So if that means there's a correlation between power and research output and, and things like that. So these are the kind of things we see. Um, even though my country somewhere, if you look closely, it, my country is Nigeria, uh, somewhere here, our research output, neuroscience output is good, even though despite our, I mean, Nigerians are very resilient, we find ways of solving our problems. So our neuroscience output over the years has also been very good. In terms of infrastructure, Africa gets, you know, no, no we don't have uh, original equipment manufacturers in Africa. You know, most of the equipment manufacturers are not in Africa. They just, you know, they just supply our distributors. So that is one of the major problems in terms of infrastructure. So there are no maintenance infrastructure within the continent. So we, Africa loses the technical expertise. There are no jobs. They lose the, the ability to be able to innovate because those training facilities or those research facilities to be able to maintain are not available. And then you also have a lot of donations. 
equipment are donated that cannot be maintained, that are not properly, people are not properly skills to use. So you find a lot of dumping of uh, equipment uh, even within the continent. There is no sustainable use of medical equipment because you know they're just either procured and just or donated. In Uganda, it was found that about 1.3 million worth of equipment was found non-functional in about 17 health facilities. So these are the problems you find within Africa. And then also the major challenge also again is personnel. Um, personnel in terms of training, there are limited training centers, you know, and people who are trained have limited exposure, especially in MRI, because they do not have access to this equipment. And those people who use this equipment usually are used, they, they use them for commercial purposes. Um, and there are few experts, and we do very few advanced MRI studies, and therefore we cannot compete, you know, equitably with uh, the rest of the world, because in terms of research and all that, uh, there are a few structured programs. They, I think uh, the only very structured program for neuroimaging are just recently started in Tanzania. And then even for people who are in researchers, the career paths are not very clear cut. You know, most people, after a while, they just move into administration. And there's, of course, poor pay. And then the, because of lack of resources, poor mentorship, you know, all these are what contributes to people who are, you know, have some knowledge, do it, they have been able to achieve a PhD, eventually leave, you know, for the West, uh, because there's a lot of brain drain. That is what you, you will see in Africa. There's a lot of people who are, who could stay behind and develop the continent, eventually leave for greener pastures in uh, other, other um, especially in the West, in the US and uh, Canada and so on. Um, a challenge also, which is funding, I think a major, one of another major funding, all the challenges are major anyhow, uh, is funding. You find that uh, poor, there's poor domestic funding. Uh, this is also a paper by Mena et al. that showed, that looked at the research output and then looked at how the funding affected the output. You find that, that most of the domestic funding came mostly from people who, the, the countries who give a lot of domestic funding were like in North Africa, which had a lot of good research output. They had better domestic funding. Uh, countries like in West Africa, the domestic funding was poor. And this is what contributes to, I think, poor research output and, and training because the domestic funding, most of the funding you get in Africa are from international organizations. Uh, if you look at also the international organizations are the, are the greatest contributors of uh, funding for research. And most of the top funders uh, come from uh, Europe and not America. And in terms of um, organizations, the NIH is the top funder of research in Africa. So these are the general- so these barriers. There so, must sorry. be inclusivity. Okay. Such collaborations must be balanced to allow greater participation of people okay. from low and middle income countries. Build capacity of researchers in the region through funded fellowships. Designing of enhanced. What is happening? Dynamics of the sorry, this was a slide that had the voice over. Allow for reduced equitable fees to promote increased participation in conferences. In terms of infrastructure, we must find ways to promote and subsidize internet access, provide alternative sources of electricity, allow open access to resources and tools. We must find ways to strengthen partnerships with organizations in low and middle income countries through networking. Industry vendors and original equipment manufacturers should increase their social and corporate responsibility to the poor regions of the world. Researchers in low and middle income countries should learn to innovate and use modern technology to solve their problems. Organizations must increase advocacy programs to push for better domestic funding for research. Grants should be made less stringent and accessible to the less to the underserved populations in low and middle income countries. Okay, so I uh, apologize. That slide was a uh, voiceover uh, done earlier. So there are tools for change. What are the tools that we can use to uh, contribute to change uh, some of these uh, challenges that we have? And one of the things I have found, I think uh, it's been networking, you know, working with people uh, who are in developed countries and then also being part of, you know, membership of global societies. These are the things I, I feel that have can change the dynamics, you know, in terms of MRI, the organizations that are key uh, things like the International Society of Magnetic Resonance in Medicine and, of course, the European Society of Magnetic Resonance in Medicine and Biology. So these are the kind of organizations that we in Africa or those people in Africa need to begin to partner with these organizations to begin to change the dynamics and help to bring collaborations 
and you know expose these uh, challenges and find ways to be able to to bridge this wide gap that exists between the West and uh, and people in Africa. And this can be done by you know having conference attendance for networking and all that. But one of the major challenges for conference attendance is that you also find that you need sponsorship, and sometimes these uh, researchers in Africa have difficulty getting uh, sponsorship for most of these conference attend attending these conferences, and most of them are done by self you know funded. So these are the areas where we need to find ways of how to increase you know uh, support for researchers in Africa. In terms of advocacy, um, in my own little way, I've been able to have links with uh, the NIH and uh, my contributions in, uh, in at Oxford. I was able to make some form of advocacy, giving lectures at several organizations. And recently, um, I received funding from uh, the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative to uh, do some training for uh, MRI scientists in Africa. So in terms of innovation, um, the uh, tools also that have been developed, you know, portable MRI scanners now, we have low field scanners who are, that are low cost, that are, you know, easily accessible, and uh, we have a lot of people working to do this. Even in Africa, we have people who have been trained, like Jones uh, Bongoloch, he's a biomedical engineer from the Barara University of uh, Technology in Uganda, has worked with uh, people like uh, Stephen Skip from Yale University, and then we also have people like Andrew Webb, who is at the Leiden University, and what's his dream or his goal is to develop MRI machines that cost about 1% of the current MRI scanner. And um, we also have people like Daniel Alexander, who is working at UCL, at University College London, who is trying to see how we can improve the image quality of low uh, field scanners by, you know, working how to what's called image quality transfer using tools to see how those, even though you have low uh, field MRI, can you use artificial intelligence to improve the quality to approach that of high field scanners that are accessible for people in the West? So these are some of the tools of, of innovations that are coming up to be able to bridge this wide gap between the, the, the North and the global uh, South. You know? So these are several things. And also companies like Hyperfine are working very hard and they've recently developed you know, portable MRIs that could be used in rural areas that are relatively, relatively, are affordable or that you can move around and also get information that can be transmitted to people that can provide um, you know solutions to such problems especially for the head most of the uh, portable mris are actually image only the head so uh, in terms of uh, funding like i said i have partners which we have received funding for with an organization called camera and we've also recently formed another organization which is called smart africa and uh, we're working towards with funding from the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative to establish an African chapter of the International Society of Magnetic Resonance Imaging. We're also working to develop a curriculum for an MRI certificate course, you know, to train MRI technologies and radiographers and develop an online resource for Africans and also hold conferences uh, working with ISMRM and uh, in, within Africa. Recently, with the funding from the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, We've been able to uh, develop some training initiatives, and we held one of the first sub-Saharan African low-field MRI workshop in Uganda. And this had participants from all over Africa, from about you know five, seven countries in Africa. And we also partnered with uh, people from Leiden University who were coming together to build the first low-field MRI within the continent, bringing all the resources. And this was a very unique opportunity to have African scientists you know, to work with, you know, other scientists from around the world to build a system within Africa. This has never been done before. This is the first time, you know, working hand in hand. And it, it, it exposed the, the students and then the researchers to a lot of, you know, uh, potentials. Um, so it, it was a dream come true for me to be part of that uh, project. You know, it was a, a, because we can see we are working towards designing by pop you know, working with people who are motivated by their passion and are supported by international organizations. There was a lot of precision work in, in, in achieving uh, what we achieved by, you know, working with uh, all of these partners to build these systems. So partnership is important, and I think that's what Africa needs. You know, uh, precision uh, tools are not relatively available in Africa, and then these are things that we need to make uh, available to researchers. But with the Africans also need a lot of willpower to be able to begin to change the dynamics and build, build these very expensive, very, these very uh, sophisticated tools within uh, the country. 
uh, during the building of the MRI in Uganda, there were a lot of challenges in terms of the, the equipment to use were not even available. Even when for shipping, the equipment that were supposed to be shipped took so long before they could arrive because of customs and several other challenges, of course, in terms of. So these are some of the challenges you find within Africa. And I think by this effort that we have started, we're beginning to uh, try to cross some of those barriers. And the opportunity of that workshop, which we held in Uganda, was gave a, a lot of opportunity for teaching. You could see uh, teaching of young scientists how to build an MRI, how MRI works, and all that. So working together was an excellent uh, opportunity to expose uh, young Africans to this advanced uh, technology. And of course, of course, Africans were able to see that, look, that this equipment is sophisticated, that you require a lot of precision, a lot of, you know, painstaking, um, you know, conscious effort to be able to create something that can work. And um, it was a good experience for us. And this was uh, a time that brought a lot of people together. It was a team effort, bringing you funders, organizations, institutions together to make this. Sense. And we've been able to achieve this. The first prototype of a low field, ultra low field system was built in uh, Uganda uh, just a couple of months ago. So we are making progress. Also, um, working with uh, funding from Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, we are making a proposal to have an International Society of Magnetic Resonance in Medicine, an African chapter. And we've been able to put together a 224 member African uh, come together from several countries, nine countries now, to make this uh, appeal to have um, a chapter where we can collaborate, where we can intermingle, where we, we can network with international organizations like the ISMRM. And we have recently submitted an application and are looking forward to a positive response from the organization. In terms of advocacy, in Cape, in Cape Town, actually, in South Africa, there's a center which is called the Cape University's Brain Imaging Center that is, that is a hub for brain research. And this is partnering with Siemens and they have a three Tesla machine and has and they've been able to turn out a lot of researchers in, in Africa. And I think one of the things that I think can help Africa is to have this kind of hubs, not just in South Africa, but scattered in all the regions of Africa, being funded by you know, international organizations to be able to expose MRI researchers to uh, these training programs for them to be able to think you know, and be able to innovate you know, and solve problems locally. So in conclusion, I just want to say that uh, networking is important. There must be targeted mentorship MRI programs in Africa that can help you know, create a path for young MRI scientists to be able to achieve their goals of and maybe to have capacity to maintain this equipment, to use this equipment. And that Africa should be taught how to fish, you know, and not be given fish. They should cut down on donations and empower young people by building their capacity and must have this cross or transatlantic corporations between this, uh, the North and the South. And Africans must also learn to innovate because the problems of Africa are unique, are different. So we must find ways to solve our own problems by understanding the technology and how to use artificial intelligence and new technology to create tools that can solve problems within the, within the continent. And, um, and I think this is, this is already happening. There's a place for equity. And I think that uh, global or international organizations who consider this when evaluating Africans in terms of um, uh, for grants or for research uh, support and things like that, because we are technically challenged and uh, sometimes, you know, disadvantaged. And I think this should be brought into uh, the, the table when these assessments are done. And then, of course, there's a need to democratize MRI, to make it, it open access tools, to make people have uh, access to some of these things to use. In terms of acknowledgement, I would like to acknowledge my you know, collaborators from Oxford and global collaborators from all over the world, from Nigeria and um, several other people. Thank you very much for listening. By the way, that's my hospital there in Nigeria. That's uh, the University College Hospital, Ibadan. Thank you. Thank you for delivering this amazing talk. Um, it's, it's, I think, the second time in one year that I'm hearing your plan about uh, having an ISMRM chapter for Africa. So let's hope that this year is going to happen because I think it will, it will help you so much for research. Um, so uh, I can see there is one question in the question and answer chat. So 
Um, question is, how do researchers in low-income countries benefit from open and reproducible research practice? Is access to open software tools a limiting factor? Yeah, thank you so much for, for that. Um, well, access to open software, it's a limiting factor based on the fact that you have poor internet uh, connectivity within most African institutions. Internet is a, is a major issue and it's expensive. Uh, so even though those tools are available on the internet, um, you need some form of mentorship to be able to find those tools that you'll be able to use for your research. So I feel one of the critical things is for, for African researchers to look for mentors who, uh, who have used these tools, or who can teach them how to use these tools. That's the first critical stage. The second stage is to be able to find ways to boost their internet access and connectivity. Uh, downloads are very expensive, you know, um, within Africa. Most, uh, as, as a researcher in Africa, um, sometimes you can, because funding is poor, most African researchers use their personal income. Like for me, I, 10, I spend about 10% of my personal income to get access to the internet, you know, every month. You know, so these are the challenges of Africa. So even though those tools are available, they are the 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 costs, you know, can be a limiting factor for young researchers. Uh, so that's why funding, mentorship are critical to uh, to give access to some of these open access tools. Mentorship, especially, because you sometimes you see something you don't even know how to use it. I recently got exposed to uh, FSL. You know, and FSL is an open source. I mean, it's, it's there, you can download, but you know, because it was through my exposure in Oxford that I was able to learn that. So I feel this kind of collaborations, you know, reaching out and teaching people will be the, the game changer for Africa. Great, thanks for answering. And I think it's actually a great paradox because, uh, you know, where, where internet is fully available at low cost, I think we, we just took this for granted like, yes, of course, it's an open source, it's on the web, you can just use it, everyone can benefit. But actually, like, everything come down to have access to the Wi-Fi and have access to internet. So I'm really glad that you have found these things out, to be honest. Um, I think we have time for a further question, and then we can uh, pass the floor to the following speaker. Um, so, um, uh, question is, if you could wish for one specific thing to happen right now to improve healthcare and specifically MRI in Africa, what would it be? Great. I would want to have um, a research hub, uh, uh, like a center where MRI is built, is maintained and is used, a clinical facility multiple for, can start with one in every region you have a, a huge center where you have it is a built center that would be, young people can access within africa they can access they can do research they can have clinical access they can also use those tools for training and teaching and, that and great is internet connection great internet connection <laughs> yeah so if you, if you have so you can start with one hub just like what with the keep uh, uh, this thing, the cubic center in South Africa, you start with one hub that is well funded and gives access to young people to try their hands to learn to see, and then you and you multiply those hubs across the, the regions in Africa, one per country that is well funded. People will stay and they will not leave, you know, because they will have tools to work with. You know, they will be able to see that they're able to collaborate with and also equitably do research with other collaborators. But these tools. Are not available now so if i'm going to wish for one thing i would want some form of high budget funder to come into africa set up a system where you can train people to maintain systems to be able to use it for research and also use it for clinical work as well where patients can have access at low cost this will change will be a game changer for africa most of the people who have this equipment within africa are commercial vendor vendors they are just out to make money and access is only to about one percent of the population so you see there is a lot of you know um disparity and uh, so that's it democratize mri you know make it available because it is a, it's an amazing tool it's an amazing tool for diagnosis for treatment uh, and i think um it can also solve because africa there's also what you call a, a, an epidemiologic transition africa is no longer just an where you have more of it infectious diseases now you're having non-communicable diseases also in africa things like hypertension diabetes you know stroke you know, are coming up, Alzheimer's disease, dementia. These are conditions that are arising in Africa. 
and you need tools like the MRI to be able to address and, and stem the tide of this kind of this growing uh, non-communicable disease in Africa. So uh, that will be my wish. That will be on my wish list. Thank you. Okay, I think we can close this talk with the slogan that you just said: "Democratize MRI." Great. All right. Thank you for your talk. And uh, you. I would like to ask to the next speaker to unmute herself. Penny, would you mind to unmute yourself if you can? Hi. Hello. Hello. Uh, morning. Good Phew. morning. I'm here. Hi. Hi. Welcome. I'll try to all right so why why you try to change your screen uh, i have to apologize with elizabeth because there was um there was a question in the question and answer uh, box that i didn't see so why you why penny sharing the screen i'm going to read you the question and the answer so could you envision a world where becoming a fat checker could be a serious career path for a scientist i think there is room for more equality control in science both misconduct and mistake and there is an oversupply of phd graduate compared to academic job I guess uh, the main question is who would pay for this kind of rule? So um, Elizabeth has commented on that if you would like to read it, but I can see her unmute herself. So I don't know if she would like to quickly reply and then we leave the stage to Penny. Uh, yeah, I mean, I uh, like I, I replied, like it, it is actually already uh, a career option, although not all journals do this. So some journals have hired already a while ago uh, years ago, people who will screen manuscripts for all kinds of problems, including image duplication. So for, uh, and specifically, Embo Journal has done an amazing job. Uh, they have always a person screening all the manuscripts for all the Embo Journals um, yeah, for image duplication and other problems. And so that is a very like a detailed job. You need to be you know, trained for that. You need to know what to look for. Uh, but they have uh, set aside some money to pay that person. And so I, I feel that more journals should be doing that. And I actually have been encouraging journals to hire people to do that because I don't feel it should be done by people like me who are unpaid. And, okay. and uh, most importantly, it shouldn't be done at the level after publication. These things should be caught before publication. And um, so I hope that journals are going to spend a little bit more time screening images um, with a person, I mean, software can do that, but you still need a person to uh, uh, to to handle the the software's response. Like uh, so, so it is a job, and and there's related jobs like editors and and, and things like that. So, journal, if you, if you like editing or writing or peer review things like that, there are jobs for you at publishers. And um, I don't always like publishers because they do make a lot of money, and uh, some of that money should be spend more to to the quality control but there are definitely jobs there if you are not really interested in doing lab work or doing um working in uh, in a university there are jobs at scientific publishers all right thank you so we can close yeah. this first hour of talk with uh yes there are there is room for other people that willing to check um research and also we have to democratize MRI. So now is the turn to Penny to talk about integrity in MRI research. So uh, please everyone but Penny mute yourself and close the camera. Penny, the floor is yours. Thanks very much. Um, so I'm in a global meeting and I'm in England, so I'm gonna put my hat on because it's rather cold here, so excuse me. Um, okay, so I'm gonna talk about integrity in MRI. What I'm not going to be talking about is um, what Elizabeth talked about, you know, absolute lying particularly. But I'm going to talk about how we can make mistakes, um, you know, with, with honest intention. So um, I'm going to briefly talk about can science tell us the truth? Why is data important? Uh, why is science uncertain? Um, why is science important? And do, why does truth and honesty matter? Um, so can science find the truth for us? Well, I'm sure you will know the answer is effectively no. Um, and before I launch into this quick reminder of the scientific method, I should say I'm no philosopher. Um, and I think you know you can get too tangled up in these things, but basically it's important to understand where we're coming from here. So there's two ways broadly of finding knowledge from uh, finding knowledge. One is deduction, the other is induction. So deduction is making an inference uh, making a sort of conclusion based on widely accepted facts and premises or definitions. That's maths. 
So y equals 3x means that x equals y over 3. We all know that. Um, if we are calibrating a flow, MRI flow experiment, uh, sorry, I've just realized you can't see my um, slide. Sorry, yeah, sorry, exactly. Yeah, I will say. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm happily looking at them on the wrong screen. Sorry. OK, right. That's so right. Okay, okay. quickly, um, so if you're looking at an MRI flow experiment and you want to calibrate it, you might fly. Um, so, yeah, you might flow water into the bucket and, um, and measure the amount of water goes up in the bucket. And you're making assumptions there that physics works. And you're you're basically using your you know your your facts about physics to deduce this um, this flow the, the calibrated flow rate. So deduction is a conclusion reached using evidence and reasoning based on widely accepted facts. But that's not usually how we move science forward. Uh, the way we usually move science forward. Now I can't move. Oh, okay. <clears throat> is Okay, right, is by induction. So the most obvious example I could think of in MRI is um, the block equations. So blocks equations are known as phenomenological equations. And that means he looked at what was going on and he created this model where she said that relaxation was exponential. So we can say that we're doing a longitudinal recovery experiment. We've got data that looks like it's coming from a longitudinal exper recovery experiment. And based on blocks equations, a blocks model, we expect the data to follow an exponential curve. And that's almost always true. But one day we do an experiment on bone um, uh, T1 measurements at, short, at zero TE, or indeed many tissues, in fact. And we find we get by exponential decay bit recovery because there's two compartments. So this model works up to a point and Block didn't look at tissue, Block looked at liquids and his model was right in that regime. But once you push it to a different regime, it starts to break down. And it, actually, it's interesting to note the inductions are basis of technology. So, you know, we always get a haste scan and we always get a T2 weighted scan when, when we run a haste scan uh, until the scanner quenches overnight. So inference is a conclusion based on so observations of samples from a population of all pop possible observations. The point is we've only got a sample of the observations. So this was uh, induction and falsification was come up by, uh, created, was conceptualized by Karl Popper. So science usually advances by induction. Our conclusions are provisional and they're the best guess at the truth in the regime for which we have data. So until we push the boundaries and prove them wrong, this is our best guess of the way the world's working. So with Block, the best guess at how recovery was, was exponential until we start looking at tissues and we start finding by exponential in certain situations. So this is, um, uh, you know, the way things work in, in all sorts of science. So, you know, historically, Newton came up with his theory of, of gravity and apples falling. And this worked very, very well for a long time. It allowed us to predict tides and look to the moon as a Jupiter and measure G. And then, of course, along came New uh, Einstein. He came up with a different theory, but it wasn't proven. It was based on, on lots of things that had been sort of pushing at the edges of Newtonian mechanics for some time. But then uh, after he'd come up with his theory, it was later proven. Data was found that could test his theory and test whether or not it was um, supported by data. So the point of this all is that you need data. But this isn't just in, um, you know, Newtonian mechanics and Einstein, it applies to us. And the most um, obvious example is when people say to us, is MRI safe? And you can't say yes to that question. You can say as far as we know, it's safe, but you can't say yes. We know there are real dangers. Obviously, you know, you can um, unfortunately uh, have terrible accidents where people can get um, hit with things from the projectile effect or burnt with um, with the RF. But the question that really asking when people ask this question is, are there bioeffects of magnetic fields? And we know there are bioeffects. We know magnetic fields can change the spin states, um, electron spin states and affect chemical reaction rates. So it's got lost there. Um, we know that magnetic fields can interact with our sensory mechanisms. But in terms of actual long-term risk, as far as we can tell at the moment, we can't find any effects. 
but we need to keep looking, we need to keep pushing back the boundaries of where we have knowledge to try and test whether this, this um, hypothesis, which is MRI, is safe in terms of bioeffects, um, to the limits. Uh, this is an example of something we did some time ago, and it's an example that I actually used to, to teach uh, undergrads that happened to be for MRI, so I thought I'd use it. So this is um, the concentrate effect on R2 star of the concentration of gadolinium in blood. And it's sort of, you know, maybe at least I had assumed it would go linearly or quadratically, and that's the data, and it's the linear and the quadratic fit there for uh, one and a half T. And then we add in 3T, and yeah, it definitely looks not quite linear or quadratic. But when you add 7T, it's, it's quadratic, but the point is the zero point um, of that quadratic equation is not at zero concentration. It's quadratic with an offset. Now, that offset would not have been clear at one and a half T. It's only as you started to push the limits of your theory, of the regime in which your theory works, you realize that it breaks down. So the point about all of this is that um, we don't know the truth, but we're always iterating towards it. So one of the ways of looking at the, the stuff I've just said is to say, well, this is a um, uh, you know, hopeless situation. We can never know way, the way the world works, but that's not the case. We, we do iterate towards the truth. and We do um, know what works in the regime we are testing it in but we don't know all possible regimes. And the clear, the most important point, the whole point of this section is to say, we need experiments to test our models. Um, we need lots and lots of data from lots and lots of different experiments. We need lots and lots of machines um, that work really well and collect accurate data um, and work in different, different environments. Uh, a bit like Godwin was talking about just now, we need machines that work in Europe, we need machines working in Africa, so we get data in different environments and different regimes to test different populations in different environments. Um, and then we need to analyze it. So when we analyze data, um, we use statistics, and this is a phrase that's often used in, in England about uh, newspaper articles about politics, but it's the same can apply to science. So as you all know, um, we can get data and we use p-values to test our um, hypotheses. So to do this, we have to define a hypothesis in advance for it to be valid. So you can't collect your data and then come up with a hypothesis um, to, uh, based on your data because you will definitely be able to find a way in which your data fits a, a p-value, a, a um, uh, um, a significant p-value. You should define your hypothesis in advance for this to be valid. Um, and it's stronger if it's directional. So if you say, well, T1 is going to be longer in water than in um, a gadolinium solution, that hypothesis will be stronger because it's directional. If you just say T1 will be different, it's not so strong. Now, the point of this is that we often say many studies are considered significant at P equals 0.05 as an example. And the important point about this is that if you say a study is significant P equals 0.05, if you do 20 studies, one of them will get an exciting result by chance. So if you do 100 studies, five of them will get an exciting result by chance. So this is one reason why often the first time you do something, it works. And the second time you do something, it doesn't work. Because the first time it's happened by chance, and the second time you throw the dice again, and it doesn't happen. Um, so the important thing here is if you do experiments lots and lots of times, or you look at lots and lots of different ways to analyze the data, you will find significant results. So this is um, data of ours, which is um, uh, just il illustrating this really. And in this case, the data was still blinded, but it's basically cystic fibrosis effects on small bowel water um, with and without a drug. So in this case, you can see apparently a difference between this 
uh, with, without the drug and with the drug. Um, but the point is, we've got error bars here. And the way this data has been analyzed is look at the areas under these curves. And this is the uh, data here showing the significant differences between the groups. But um, I think you should, you know, you can look at, certainly look at the areas under the curves. You can um, see that the difference between the individual people is not that great. The difference between the groups might be uh, quite big, but the difference between the individual people may not be because this is what the error bars are here. This is um, an example uh, showing the effects of multiple comparisons. So in this case, so what, multiple comparisons is the problem of, let's go back to here, one in 20 studies will achieve an exciting result by chance. So in this case, somebody has trawled the data in the, on the internet to look at, find two things that correlate over time. So this is in black, the number of people killed by venomous spiders and in red, the letters winning the word of the Scripps National Spelling Bee in the USA. And you can see over um, about uh, 10, 15 years, there appears to be a correlation in these two. Now, you can be certain this is a case of correlation, not causation, I think, because there would be no hypothesis whatsoever for these two things to be linked. And um, this is almost certainly just done by trawling the internet. But you can imagine that if you start trawling lots and lots of different data sets, you will find these sorts of correlations and they don't necessarily mean anything. Now, we do in MRI have software like SPM and FSL to address this problem because in MRI, we have tens of thousands of voxels in an image that will create correlations if you start looking for them. And so there's processes set up in SPM, FSL and similar software um, to address these issues. But if you're not doing that sort of analysis and these sorts of tools, then you need to be really, really careful to make sure you don't get multiple comparisons problems. Um, there is uh, a way to check whether these sorts of biases are coming into the literature. So the problem with this is that if you get this nice positive result, you might feel inclined to publish it because, hey, you've got a positive result that, you know, you, the letters winning the, the spelling bee are linked to venomous spiders. So you think, well, I'm going to publish that because it's an exciting result. But what you don't do is publish the, the negative results. And um, this is a way of looking at this result. So I think it's actually easy if you look at this graph first, which is the graph that's showing the, a meta, the results of a meta-analysis of the effects of aspirin on treating preeclampsia. So there was one very, very large study that showed no effect uh, so this is the effect size this way, and this is the size of the study. So there's no, in the very, very large study, so very big study here, um, there was no effect size of using aspirin on um, to treat preeclampsia. Now, if you have a look at these studies down here, these are very, very small studies, and they all showed a positive effect. But what you would expect is that these data, and in fact, there are some other points here that are um, also around the, the, the zero points, particularly the larger, somewhat larger trials. If the data was distributed as you'd expect, you would expect some trials to give a negative result. And what this is suggesting is that people are more likely to publish results that give the result they, they want, the result they expect, because there was a hypothesis that uh, aspirin might help in preeclampsia, but not to give the results that don't show what they expected to see. So what happens was the data ended up with lots of small studies that showed no result. It wasn't until somebody did a, uh, showed, showed a result. It wasn't until somebody did a big study, they showed no result. And this is how you'd expect it to be distributed if you were doing a, um, publishing everything that was ever published. So if this was the effect size, so it could be no result, a positive result, a negative result, for big studies, you'd get small variations around this. And for small studies, you get large variations around this. They call them funnel plots because they look like funnels. Um, and so these graphs should, should be the sort of way the data should be distributed. So you should be seeing the, the, the wrong results in the literature because by chance, some results would not be positive, will not give the result you're expecting. You expect a variation around the, the true value, whatever that is. The expected value and if you're not seeing that in the literature there's a publication bias which means people are not publishing 
things that aren't giving the result they expect. Now, why aren't they doing that? They might not be doing that for um, uh, you know bad reasons, for reasons of um, basically lying. They might be doing it because they 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 assume they've made a mistake, or because they feel that somehow they they've they've you know slipped up, um, and so they're not going to publish that result. And when they get the result they expect, then they're much more likely to publish it. Um, you know, there's a there's a really good reason to think that aspirin, which thins the blood, might help in preeclampsia, um, but it doesn't. Now, there is a way to overcome this, what's called the file draw effect, which is you get this result, the, not the one you expected. You think, oh, goodness, I've done something wrong. You stick it in your filing cabinet. And the way to do that is to register the protocol. And there's there's. You, you know, you develop your idea, you design your study. At that point, you register what you're going to do somewhere in the public domain. You collect and analyze your data, you write the report and you publish your report. And there is a, another approach where you actually publish for peer review your study design at this point, and then you have a second peer review at this stage. But by doing this registering a protocol, um, you can overcome this file draw effect. And this is now required in some places for clinical trials. And it's strongly to be you know, uh, advocated for for clinical trials because clinical trials are so important for um, understanding how we use healthcare resources that it's, it's particularly important that we do this sort of uh, pre-registering of protocols. <coughs> so the other thing is... Um, Optimate. So I've just talked about the file draw effect where you kind of put away negative results. But there's also optimize, like optimism bias, which is the sort of inverse of that. But if you get the result you expected, you're much more likely to publish it. So, you know, we all know those papers that are sitting in our inboxes waiting to be read. Um, well, uh, or, you know, <laughs> you're waiting for your supervisor to read or your, your uh, um, uh, co-authors co to read. And we know that you're much more likely to read it if it's an amazing result you want to get out there than if you're sort of it's just another result that you're you're adding to the literature. So um, it's, it's important that everything is published. Now, one thing, um, this graph here is actually aimed to illustrate a really important way that this should that sort of links to this idea of optimism bias. So. When you get data, and I'm always very shocked in England when I uh, get new students in the undergraduate class, because in England at, at school, students are encouraged to remove outliers. So they might look at this data set here, which is just fecal volume against gestational age. It's really old data. And they might look at this data and they might go, well, it looks something wrong with that point. We'll remove that point. <laughs> you can't do that. But if you look at this data, this is actually data from two groups of patients. It's um, healthy patients, patients who've known to have uh, fetal growth restriction. But the way we're looking at this data here is blinded. So we haven't separated the data into groups. And what this means is we could look at this data point and we could say, that looks a little bit weird. That's a very big baby for 26 weeks. Let's go and have a look at that data set again and just check we've not made a mistake. And we can look at these data points. I mean, in fact, in this data, I'd say there are no outliers, but if we had a point up here, we could happily go and look at that data point and say, you know, is there something wrong with that data point? Is there something we've done wrong? We've, we've you know, missed out some slices. We added in more slices. We've counted the data twice. And we can review that data point before we unblind the data. And then we, we you know, once we've done that, we're in a really difficult position if we start looking at the data and saying, well, that one looks a bit odd because that's, you know, a healthy baby that's really big. We want to bring it into uh, an, an abnormal baby that's really big. We want to bring it into line with the, the graph. So you look at the data, blind data review uh, before you unblind the data. And I have to say, I learned this quite late in my career from um, a company we worked with uh, who were very wanted their data to be absolutely uh, perfectly analysed in terms of scientific rigour and it wasn't a drug company it was a food company and they taught us to do this and I, I find it so useful it takes a lot of stress out of data analysis you get the data whilst it's blinded um, and it's complete and it's completely blinded it's not like you know which the groups and you know there are two groups this is completely blinded data we don't know which group any of these belong to um, and we just look at the data and see is there anything that looks weird 
actually this blind data review shouldn't just occur on the data points it should actually occur on how the data has been managed you know how the data has gone through the whole process of being and collected analyzed stored the whole thing should be reviewed and in fact again in england um, we have this done by our rec our um, ethics committees our irb sometimes they come and check how we're managing our data the data presentation should be clear and honest. Now, this graph here, uh, these two graphs show um, something to do with the statistical methods used to analyze the vote counts in the 2016 election in the USA. Now, honestly, I don't understand what it's saying, but that's the point, really. Uh, I'm just going to read it out. People have tried other statistical methods to analyze Biden's vote tally, such as the Mebane second digit test. Using the second digit in the total votes to calculate, the results shows that there are multiple significant differences between Biden, while none of those de deviations to Trump are more than 5%. This indicates a pattern of sudden increase in votes for Biden is abnormal. So this is trying to prove that there's something fishy in the data. So you look at these two graphs and you say, wow, that's very variable. And then you look at the one for Trump and say, well, that's very smooth. So there must be something weird going on here. But then you look at the scale on these graphs, and if you blow the scale up on the Trump graph to be the same as on the Biden graph, you see, well, actually, they don't look quite so different. So there's, as you know, there's many, many different ways of presenting data, and they should be clear. I'd say this is dishonest, and I'd say this is unclear. You know, this is really confusing. Goodness knows what they're talking about. Um, and it certainly feels a bit like data phishing, you know, if we find the Mebane second digit test, maybe we could try the Mebane third digit test and the Mebane fifth digit test to find out um, whether or not there's a difference in these data sets. Um, the data should be um, secure, uh, shareable and uh, um, uh, sorry, secure, searchable and shareable. So secure, not kept on memory sticks and old disks. Searchable, kept in a good data uh, directory structure. And um, uh, search shareable. So this is showing, you know, the life cycle of the data, collect the data, archive the data, share the data and delete the data. Right, I think, um, am I running out of time, Laura? Uh, yes, you are. But actually, we just been notified, and this is an announcement for the attendee as well. And um, the fourth uh, um, speaker is now able to attend today. So if you are a few minutes uh, longer, it's fine. Don't worry. Hopefully, but I won't. I won't keep you too long. <laughs> okay. Hopefully, you hear me instead of speaking. But sorry, I'll just, I'll just finish then. Um, so uh, finally, we're going to publish the data. Um, we need to have it peer reviewed. Um, and I think this is very important that we check which journals we're using because some of the journals, the peer review is less rigorous than others nowadays. Um, and I, I have to take a moment to talk about blinded review in, in uh, the literature. One way we can get um, uh, in bad results into the literature is to have poor peer review. This is a study that looked at the um, peer review of otherwise identical papers that were supposedly written by uh, ex-presidents of the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons. And they basically um, were reviewed double blind or single blind reviews. So that means the reviewers did or didn't know the apparent authors. And if they, they knew the authors, they got um, much more likely to be published than if they didn't know the authors. Meaning basically because the authors were the ex-presidents of the um, American Orthopaedic Surgeon Society. They were assumed to be writing good papers. So we know we all have bad days. Maybe they didn't write a good paper, but they're more likely to get through if they're assumed to be from a good society. Now, there's lots and lots of reasons why we might want double blind review, but this is one of them, just to stop um, sort of sloppy review, <coughs> allowing for sloppy science to get through. And of course, I'm sure these people don't do sloppy science, but we all make mistakes. So in conclusion, really, why is science uncertain? Science is uncertain because the models on which theories are based are incomplete. So it might be um, in the study we were doing a cystic fibrosis of the gut. We hadn't taken account of BMI or height or educational background. 
And as time goes on, the understanding increases and the models take account of more variables. We use statistics to define our results, false positives, false negatives. We can have bad science. And by that, I don't mean dishonest science, which Elizabeth was talking about. I'm just talking about making multiple comparisons, um, trawling your data to find a result, um, publication bias, so publishing things that are exciting and forgetting about things that are boring, and scrappy science, where, you know, just sort of sloppy science. And the problem with that is it fills the literature with data that adds noise and makes it much harder to prove or disprove a hypothesis in, um, uh, in, um, in a meta-analysis. So I'm going to skip through these slides. And sorry, they were actually quite quick slides, I should say. And just talk about this. Now, I'm not suggesting in any respect this is sloppy science, OK? This is to talk about the AstraZeneca um, vaccine. And at the time, this is a couple of years ago, at the time this was huge news across the world. And there was a very small mistake in one of the trials of the drug, drug um, which led to some patients getting two doses of the vaccine, whilst one, others had a half dose in their first shot, followed by a full dose in their second. Now, in the grand scheme of things, this probably wasn't important. I'm not a virologist, so I don't know. But this result, this this uh, error led to a lot of confusion. And to be honest, you know, it led to me to be a bit confused and concerned at the time. And given what happened with the vaccine, certainly in our country, where some people still won't have them, um, this was the sort of thing that just led to confusion and upset. Now, I'm not in any sense um, blaming the AZ team for this mistake or saying they shouldn't have published the data or used it. It was obviously a very, very difficult time and things were happening fast. But the point is, in this such a high profile um, experiment, something like this can cause a lot of upset. And of course, there are many other examples with this, which are much less high profile, where some small uh, change can upset the literature and upset uh, users. So finally, one of the reasons that we need to be so careful with our data is this. So this is um, uh, a problem that's been in the tobacco industry and now is in the climate change, uh, in the carbon uh, industries. Basically, ExxonMobil um, and indeed the tobacco industry and other uh, uh, companies involved in selling pet petrochemicals are very good at doing science. They do very, very good science um, and they fill the literature with science. But what they do is that they tend to um, then cherry pick that literature in what they have put out. So this study showed that 83% of peer review papers and 80% of the internal documents acknowledge climate change, but only 12% of their advertorials, so that sort of uh, articles in the New York Times did so, with 81% expressing doubt. And they could do this because they used the scientific literature and cherry picked out what they needed to prove their um, results. And in um, in doing this, they chose to emphasize uncertainty in scientific conclusions regarding potential of the greenhouse effect. So the point is that if we put out data that is variable and noisy because it's sloppy in any way, we're adding to this uncertainty, which will allow people to pick out the results they want to prove something one way or another. Now, I'm not suggesting everybody's in the process of trying to deny climate change, but it might be much smaller things. People want to do a meta-analysis that really think is going to prove their hypothesis. And if you've got data there that can help them um, one way or another, that's not going to be good unless it's really intense, uh, really um, rigorous data. So science needs to be squeaky clean is my conclusion. Thank you. And I'm sorry for overrunning. That's OK. Thank you for the great talk. Um, I was um, typing in the chat that we have now time for further discussion as the fourth speaker has not show up. So um, any question for Penny? Yes, we have one. So how do you ensure that the source of shared data is adequately recognized and well represented? Um, so I think um, that should be by, you mean in a big meta-analysis? 
So um, the person that made the question is actually Godwin. So yes, as you are Godwin. already on stage, <laughs> no, that's fine. Please, Godwin, unmute yourself so you, we can start the discussion. I'm trying um, to understand. Thank you, Penny. Uh, can you hear me, Penny? Thank you so much for uh, extensive presentation. Um, why I'm asking that question is that, you know, there's the, this um, new thing about big data and, and, and sharing data of uh, populations and things like that. And one of the uh, fears that I've experienced right now in Africa is that um, people don't want to share their data, especially Africans. They don't want to give their data because they feel that um, people in the West will use their data and then publish papers and do not recognize them adequately. And that they could, because they have the power for analysis, which Africans do not have. So uh, um, is there a way that when you give out your data, you have your data set and you give it out? Is there a way to ensure that whoever uses it recognizes you adequately? And if he doesn't, you can actually um, raise an alarm and say, look, that's my data. That analysis, you know, I should be given adequate um, recognition for that data. Because what there's a fear, usually, like I said, among my colleagues in Africa, that um, you know you don't you want to you want to own your data. You don't want to share what you have, even though we don't have the capacity to do analysis. So I don't know what your thoughts are regarding yeah, this. Uh, I think I, I can see that would be um, a big concern, particularly if you can collect data and not analyze it. I'll be honest, it's often a concern for people in um, Europe and other, elsewhere as well. They collect data and, and in fact, we are often forced now to share data quite quickly after we've collected it and people want to be able to analyze it themselves first before they share it. So it's, I can see it's a particular issue for Africa, but it is actually a global concern. Um, people who do meta-analysis of data do tend to, um, uh, well, I mean, I, I believe they certainly should uh, acknowledge where their data is coming from. And then that sort of goes without saying they should do doesn't mean to say people always will, um, but they should do. Uh, and again, I would suggest that maybe sometimes things happen because of deliberate mistakes and sometimes things happen because of, you know, accidental slips, but obviously those slips shouldn't happen. But one way to avoid it is to become part of a big uh, consortium that's collecting data. So if, for instance, there's a sub study looking at, um, I don't know, brain development over um, childhood, you might want to collect data from lots of different um, communities. And if if your country or your town can contribute some of that data, you become, become part of the consortium. And that consortium is acknowledged in every paper as probably an author in every paper. So that would be one way. But to be honest, if the data is shared, I think it should usually um, uh, be acknowledged, the sources of the data, always. <laughs> And I guess if it's not, then you should be able to complain. But of course, if your data is one data set in a, a thousand, it might be quite hard to identify that. All right. Thank you for your answer. Thank you. Um, we have actually another question from Elizabeth that as well is on stage. So <laughs> I was kind of suggesting the speaker to maybe start the discussion. And this is happening naturally. So I don't know. Um, Elizabeth, if you would like to unmute yourself and make the question then, or I can just read it. So um, here we go. I can read it. Yeah. Yeah, so um, I was wondering for Professor Gowland, like what would be some scientists, uh, some ways that scientists have cheated with MRI images? Have you, have you ever come across that? I'm a person who is looking at MRI of at uh, sorry at scientific images that have been manipulated or or duplicated. Have you ever come across ways that people are trying to cheat scientific results by, for example, photoshopping MRI images? Would that be something that is happening? I'm sure it's happening, but but has that been happened that you've seen? You're muted. You're muted. Sorry, I can't unshare my screen for some reason, if somebody can unshare it for me. Um, but um, yeah, I'm not aware of that. Um, I In this session, I deliberately didn't look into actual fraud in MRI because I knew you were talking before me. Um, but I, yeah, I'm not aware of any examples. I'm not sure if there's a reason why we might not. Um, I think MRI people are pretty good with data with image image analysis. So things like um, 
it might mean they're very good at, at manipulating the data. So, for instance, some of the key examples we've seen of, you know, differences in noise in, in I'm aware of fraudulent images and the things like errors in noise. I think an MR person wouldn't make that error because they're very familiar with images. Um, but that might mean they're just really, really good at doing it. Uh, so we and so we don't know. <laughs> so they might be very, very, very uh, well um, placed to make inaccurate data, uh, fraudulent data. But I'm not aware of any cases. Okay, thank you. Well, one of the questions before was, is there any uh, possibility to have a career for research integrity? I think there is room in MRI then. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it happens. Like I, I don't feel qualified yeah, sure. to, to look at MRI images myself. Like for me, they all look very similar, but uh, I'm sure yeah. there's uh, there's fraud in that as well. Like I, I look sure. at Western blots, but uh, yeah, it happens there. It probably happens everywhere. Yeah, and that's, um, as we said before, is concerning because even if there are few cases, the effect that those few cases has on uh, the overall scientific results and on the um, effect on the general public is massive. So um, we we certainly should start to avoid and reduce the this practice. Um, so if answered Godwin's question with a much more precise answer than me. Yeah, so um, Francesco, I think, comment on the elsewhere. So uh, having a clear license attached to the data and identify the term of the sharing, if the license is not respected, you can challenge them, worst case, in court. Of course, that also becomes expensive and not always feasible. Yeah. I completely agree. Um, and please, speaker, stay unmuted and with the camera on because we have still ten minutes or so for the discussion. So it would be it would be nice to to be here together. Um, so I think Francesco again has a question for the audience. So speaker included, I would say. Um, we will be taking about pre-registration and registered reports, specifically in the MRI method field in the next session. Oh, okay. So what do you think about uh, pre-registration in general? Will will it like help research integrity somehow, on your opinion? I think it will certainly help with um, uh, the file draw effect, people not publishing stuff that doesn't give the result they expect. Um, I think, uh, don't go away, Godwin. <laughs> um, I think that the um, problems of I think I think that the way it's done uh, with sort of double peer review needs to be thought about carefully, so we don't end up having to accept papers that aren't very good. Because there's way, many ways that papers can be bad, not just to do with you know whether or not they were um, giving a result that's that's the data is actually um, valid. Because you need to also make sure it's it's presented in a way that's meaningful and understandable and other, otherwise um, accurate. So I think just pre-registering isn't enough to get a paper published, but it certainly is important to get, it should be a key part of getting paper published, to see many papers at least. And so would be better like to gauge um, the decision on publish or not um, from the journal point of view, like based on the integrity of the research. So if you pre-register and you follow your pre-registration and then you get non null result, it's still good science and it might still be valid to be yeah. published rather than if you manipulate your data and result to obtain really good science to get published. It's just a bad, a bad science practice. I think the thing is that that's true, that getting the result, the data in its own right is important, but it's not everything. So you could then present it in a completely unhelpful way. You could present it in a way that maybe, you know, ex explains away a, a negative result, even though it was actually a negative result. You could try and under, undermine that negative result. So I think, and I, this, I mean, I think it would be helpful to have some input from the, the audience here, because I know this is a hot topic at the moment in the ML community. Um, I believe myself that the two stage process is important but the first stage should not be the gatekeeping to publication. It should be the second stage of the gatekeeping. So you pre-register the report. You may peer review it at that point, but it's the second peer review that's the final stage. 
And the second peer review may be require, we may say should require the first stage that you should have pre-registered, but I think you should still have the second stage peer review. Now, yeah. other people disagree with me and I would be very happy to be argued down. Well, I guess in the next session, if you attend, you can you can have room for arguing with people about that. I've got a platform here to say my point of view. And that's a bit unfair. <laughs> I think I think it's a really good point of view. So thanks for sharing. And I saw Elizabeth nodding, and I can see Godwin that has uh, turned on the camera. So either of you have something to add to this? Well, um, I go with um, Professor Goland. I think she has more experience, and I agree with her that you know, the second stage is the most. I think the most important. But pre-registration is important. It's good, but the second stage is the most definite one that you will want to go with. Thank you, Robin. <laughs> what do you reckon, Elizabeth? Well, I, I, I think from my experience, uh, the the types of the types of misconduct or or potential misconduct that I've engaged or have found is usually happened before clinical trials so it's more in the in the preclinical investigations things like western blots and it's probably harder or much harder to cheat once a, a research stage uh, has reached um, the, the clinical stage where patients are involved and, and things are tested because there usually there's many more people involved it's much harder to cheat there's pre-registration of course but but also multiple people working together. And if one person wants to cheat at that phase, I think it's much harder, which is a good thing. You, you of course, want to have people push back when, when one person wants to cheat results. You want other persons to say, well, you know, you shouldn't be cheating at this point. And so for from my point of view, and, and granted, this is very limited. I, I look at images, uh, things like Western blots or microscopy images, it appears that most of the cheating happens at the preclinical phase, which, and those phases are, are usually not pre-registered. Pre so yeah, I, I, I think pre-registration pre is, is amazing and good, but it doesn't, it doesn't take away the, the preclinical fraud that I'm seeing mostly. Interesting. Um, well, I guess, it's good that if it's happened, it happened in the preclinical one because at the clinical stage, you you might be, it might be that your results are harmful for people. So in some sense, it's good that it's in the preclinical. Um, but general sense, it would be better if it's not happening at all. Of course, of so. course, of course, yeah. And 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 I I want to add that you know I'm looking at images, so I can see sometimes fraud in images. There's many ways people can do fraud, which are almost undetectable by just looking at paper. So I I can detect certain types of fraud, but there might be other types of fraud that could happen in the clinical phases, even with pre-registration that are barely uh, undetectable. Un uh, and, and I would say again, that pre-registration is not really tackling the issue of fraud. It's a tackling, well, it depends what you call fraud, but it's not um, I suppose you could call it fraud to not publish a positive or a negative, res an unexpected result. But I think people don't think of that as fraud. They don't, mm. they're not doing it deliberately. They're just, it's just life, you know, life catches up with you right. and you don't publish that result. So this is forcing you to publish those results. Or if you don't publish it, at least it will be recorded in the literature that you did the experiment. <coughs> but so, I don't know. Um, oh, sorry, carry on. I was just going to say, Francesco's uh, come back and said um, that the second stage is peer reviewed, but you have to make the promise of publication. So, Francesco, what I would say is I wonder whether there's room for, uh, in some um, medical communities, there are registration pro pr platforms where the, the, pro the, the, um, the, the study is pre registered, um, clinicaltrials.org in UK. Um, and then that guarantees that you're going to follow that protocol. It doesn't guarantee publication, which I suppose I can see your point. That wouldn't stop the problem of publication bias. But 
um, well, there are a couple of things that I actually would like to comment. Um, one is if we have this two stage system, um, the first stage can actually publish it somehow in a, um, in a way that like you will have a collection of pre register study and with the outcome. So which one of them um, actually make um, the journal, which one of them have been then conducted with integrity or not, um, which one of them have null result, which one of them have good result, etc. So um, I think there is another session during the MRI together about revolution on the publication project pro um, process. So it might be it might be a room for discussion in that session as well. But uh, I mean, the way the way that uh, results are published is clearly um, having a bad feedback effect on researcher if we then are pushed to cheat to have our things published, isn't it? Um, and I think the other thing is it might be that uh, we have to acknowledge even further that in medical study we work with a human body that is a complex system from a model point of view. So at the beginning of your presentation, Penny, you were show the bucket and the water pulling in it. And this is a really simple model, isn't it? You got the bucket, you got the water, and you know exactly what's happened with the physics. But uh, human body is not straightforward. It's a complex system. It's formed by many subsystems that interact together. And you have what they are called emerging properties in physics for complex system. And they interact in many ways. So even with the good intention, we even with everything, you you might have some uh, unexpected result just because um, the system that we are studying is high complex. And as, as you said, we still don't know how all the part works and all the part interact. So in this case, if we obtain null result, is not uh, blame the human body network, it's just, okay, we probably have more things to discover because we have this null result in this case. And there is more more research to there is more room for new research to find out what was going on. Um, I hope you agree with my words. Actually, <laughs> no, you're right. <clears throat> this, um, this is complex. Yeah, and there are many point of view. So, all right, um, Calvin, carry on. Yeah, I so I say I totally agree with you. I like the uh, analogy you gave with the human body and the bucket. That the human body is complex. <laughs> you know, you cannot. Uh, it's not a linear. You know, uh, kind of um, assessment you can give. Or anything can happen, and there are a lot of genetic variations, environmental, nutrition. It's it's it's, uh, it's like the 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 complexities. Uh, you know, uncountable. So I agree with you. The one working with the human body you need and i think that's where large or big data comes in you need to be able to have a huge yeah. chunk of different populations you know to be able to make uh very uh cogent um deductions you know and and what um professor golan talked about the mri safety we do not know um you know some way maybe in another way if we have more data we can in a few years begin to tell about maybe the subtle you know distortions that occur in the human body when we when we undertake an MRI, especially with its three seven Teslas that are going out now. So uh, data is very very important, and if it's well collected, well analyzed, the information that we can get from it can actually make uh, very remarkable changes and uh, help redirect things. Yeah, definitely. Um... Yeah. All right, I think it's almost time to wrap up this session. So if you have any further comment, it's time to type in the chat. Or if the speaker have any further comment, please unmute yourself and, and make it. No? Are we good? Perfect, then. OK, so <laughs> thanks, everyone, for coming. Um, I just would like to point out that we are in this session, we are connecting US, Africa, and UK. So that's, I mean, mm -hmm. that's a really, <laughs> that's a really great uh, things also on other than the topic we touch in this session. So thank you everyone for coming to uh, today. And I just would like to point out that there is another 
talk starting in three hour time on quality control mechanism. And uh, well, a round of applause to the speaker. I do it for you, attendees. If you would like to type some applause in the chat, feel free to do it. And um, well, thank you everyone for coming. Thank, thank to the speaker to deliver this great talk. Um, please uh, join Gather Town if you would like to carry on the, with the discussion. And if you have this three hour to kill to the next session as well, just go to Gather Town and chat with everybody. Thank you so much, everyone. Bye. Bye.